The next item of business is a debate on Motion 4472 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Local Government Finance Scotland Order 2017. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Derek Mackay to speak to and move the motion. Uh, up to eight minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the excitement continues. The purpose of today's <laughs> debate on the Local Government Finance Order is to seek Parliament's approval to the guaranteed allocations of revenue funding to individual local authorities for 2017-18. It also seeks agreement to the allocation of additional funding for 2016-17, which has been identified since the 2016 order was approved this time last year. The 2017-18 settlement delivers a strong settlement for local government, as we recognise that local government is essential to the health, well-being and prosperity of every community in Scotland. The Scottish Government is committed to working together in partnership with local government and the total package of funding available in 2017-18 continues to be focused on the delivery of our joint priorities to deliver sustainable economic growth together with protecting frontline services and the most vulnerable in our society. The 2017-18 the Scottish Government will provide councils with a total funding package worth over £10.4 billion. This includes revenue funding of over £9.6 billion and support for capital expenditure of over £786 million. Today's order seeks Parliament's approval for the distribution and payment of over £9.3 billion out of the total revenue of over £9.6 billion. The remainder will be paid out as specific grant funding or other funding which will be distributed later as agreed with local government. As part of the overall package, we will provide an additional £107 million to support the integration of health and social care services, assist local authorities in raising attainment and closing the attainment gap by providing Attainment Scotland funding of £170 million, maintain the pupil-teacher ratio and remove the council tax freeze and implement council tax reforms. With regards to the final point, I was pleased to see that all 32 local authorities have now set their council tax levels for next year, with all councils increasing their levels by no more than 3%. This will provide most councils with increased spending power, whilst at the same time providing an element of protection to some of the most vulnerable in our society. A further £160 million funding for local government was announced during Stage 1 of the Budget Bill and the revenue funding element £130 million is included in the order being debated today. T taking, of course. Murdo Fraser. Very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. He will know that in the Budget yesterday, the Chancellor of the Exchequer announced an additional £144 million in Barnet Consequentials coming to the Scottish Government for the next financial year. Has the Cabinet Secretary reflected on uh, how much, if any, of that money might be given to local authorities, particularly given the pressures on some of them to introduce local rates relief schemes for businesses hit by the rates revaluation? Derek McCann. Uh, to confirm, no, no decisions have been taken in that context, but specifically on the local rates relief schemes, I do believe that the £160 million that local authorities at that time weren't anticipating is certainly to be used at their discretion. I would encourage local authorities to think about relevant local rates relief schemes with the resources uh, that they have, and it is very interesting, having looked at the 32 local authority uh, budgets and spending decisions they've uh, taken, that many will have that option, and some are actively considering whether a local rates relief scheme is appropriate uh, to them. Uh, but taking the additional funding along with next year's settlement plus the other sources of income available to councils through the reforms to council tax and funding for health and social care integration, the overall potential increase in spending power to support local authority services amounted to over £400 million or 3.9%. But as a result of 11 councils not increasing their council tax levels eh, by the maximum allowable 3%, this has reduced overall support for services, that figure, to £383 million, or 3.7% in cash terms. And this represents a very strong and fair settlement under the circumstances. Uh, for information, in addition, there is over £112 million of revenue funding not covered by this order, but which will be distributed later, including £37.5 million for the Teachers Induction Scheme, £22.5 million for temporary accommodation funding, £42.9 million being the balance of the Council Tax Reduction Scheme funding, and £9.4 million being the balance of discretionary housing payments funding. 
The 2017 order also seeks approval for the changes to the funding allocations for 2016-17 of over £51.7 million, which were either held back from the 2016 order or have been added in order to fund a number of agreed spending commitments which have subsequently arisen. These include £37.5 million to fund the Teachers Induction Scheme, £5 million to support the 1 plus 2 languages policy, £2.4 million to support the council tax reform changes and £1.7 million to provide additional financial support to flooded communities. Although not part of today's order, the settlement for local government includes £756.5 million, which fulfilled our commitment to COSLA that we would maintain local government share at 26% of the Scottish Government's capital budget. This was before the extra £30 million I announced at stage one of the budget bill, which is additional to that and brings the total of capital to £786.5 million. Presiding officer, a fair and competitive business rate regime is critical to our economy. The early range of measures I announced included in the draft budget uh, included the cutting the poundage by 3.7 per cent, uh, taking 8,000 uh, businesses out of large business supplement, increasing the small business bo bonus threshold, overall a tax cut worth £155 million next year. Uh, in addition to that, of course, there were further measures uh, announced which take the total reliefs available uh, in 17-18 to £660 million, pounds, including the additional support for key sectors such as hotels, pubs, restaurants and cafes, renewables nationwide and those with offices in Aberdeen in Aberdeenshire. It is of course up to councils how to decide, as we have just uh, touched upon, how best to deploy the additional funding that I have announced for local government, along with all the other resources at their disposal. But the measures that I have taken did free up councils to use their powers through the Community Empowerment Act to introduce local rates relief schemes to address any other local issues. So in summary, presiding officer, the total funding from the Scottish Government to local government next year amounts to over £10.4 billion. These funding proposals deliver a fair financial settlement for local government, which will be strengthened by joint working to improve outcomes for local people eh, with the key commitments of improving educational attainment and health and social care integration provided for. Presiding officer, I now move that the Parliament approves the Local Government Finance Scotland Order for 2017. I now call on Alex Rowley to speak to and move Amendment 4472.1. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Rowley. I thank you, President Officer. In, in moving my amendment today, can I draw Parliament's attention to this report that, that was published this week by the Accounts Commission? And in particular, I draw their attention to where the Accounts Commission talks about future funding. And they say, if approved, the 1718 settlement means that total revenue will decrease by 9.2 per cent from £10.5 billion in 2010 11 to £9.5 billion in 1718. Uh, they go on to say that the Fraser Allender Institute predicts a total reduction of £1 billion to local government revenue funding between 2016 17 and 2020 21. And really, I think that that would be my, my, my key point in saying to the government today that we basically have to, the government needs to get its head out the sand and recognise the massive challenges that local public services are facing right across Scotland. And, yeah. Kate Forbes. Thank you. Just on that point, does the member also recognise though, that that reduction is less than the reduction in the Scottish Government's overall budget? Alex Rowley. I've been clear for the last number of years that failed Tory austerity is having a real detrimental impact on public services right across Scotland. I'm absolutely clear about that. But I'm equally clear this Parliament was never set up to simply be a conveyor belt for failed Tory austerity. And we need to therefore stand up for Scotland, stand up for public services and invest in public services. So the deal that has been done with the Greens and the SNP will result in £170 million less going into local government budgets. I spoke yesterday to a councillor who, who is standing down, who's retiring, and I would want to put on record, presiding officer, our thanks to, to all the councillors, to all parties and none that will be standing down in, in May. But this councillor made the point to me, he said, why would anybody want to be a councillor in this current climate? 
and I was saying, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, all we seem to actually do year on and year out is decide what services to cut. And that's, that's the reality of local <laughs> government at this time. But whilst Derek Mackay talks about £9.6 billion, what we've got to remember is what that means actually for real people out there in terms of the cuts that are taking places to services. And what that means for, for people is that, that there, are, there are tens of thousands of people on waiting lists up and down Scotland trying to get an assessment to get a care package. There are then those who have had an assessment, are told that they, can, they, need, they need a care package, but are unable to get that care package. For people trapped in hospitals, it means they can't get out of hospitals because the local authorities don't have the investment to be able to put the care packages in place. So I would I pick up on what Cosler said yesterday in terms of Philip Hammond's budget and the consequentials of that budget for Scotland. And I would say to Mr Mackay, uh, the case that Cosler is making for part of those consequentials to be passed on to local government into areas like health and social care, where there is clearly a need for further investment and into education, into the classroom and into teaching assistance. Um, Mr Mackay also mentioned the council tax, and I would make an appeal to him today, because a few months ago, in a debate similar to this, Mr Mackay said that he was willing to get round the table with other parties to look at an alternative to the council tax. And in 2007, the First Minister said the council tax is unfair and no amount of tinkering around with the council tax can make it fair. I agreed we are then and I agree we are today and that's why we need to get together, work together and get a replacement to the council tax. So I would say to Derek Mackay that will he look at bringing all parties back together again, given that we took part in this commission previously and believed that that would lead to the, the unfair council tax being removed, we would need to agree a deal that says that our starting point is that we're going to get rid of the council tax and we need to set a timetable for it. But I think the government should be willing to get round the table with other parties. The council tax is unfair. The council tax cannot be allowed to continue. It's regressive and it must go. So let's work together to get rid of that council tax. Presiding officer, in local government there is also jobs. 27,000 jobs have gone over the last 10 years in local government. We need to be able to address that and we need to be able to invest. Bruce Crawford. Forgive Wait me. for your microphone, please. It's, the microphone's now on. I thank Alec Riley for giving me. I just wonder if Alec Riley could explain something for me. Labour complaining here about the settlement for local authorities, yet in Stirling, the Tory Labour Control Council just put, agreed a budget of £3.5 million policy growth within it while freezing the council tax. Does that not clearly demonstrate the reality that it's actually quite a good settlement for local government on the ground, but all that Labour doing here is continually complain about it? And if we could stop complaining about it, actually we might be able to have a serious discussion about the future in these circumstances. Alex Riley. The council tax is regressive. It is unfair. Some local authorities have taken the decision that it would be unfair to put an increase on to the residents in the area that they represent. What we need to do is get rid of the council tax. And that's why I'm saying to Derek Mackay today, I'm saying to him, let's work together. The council tax is unfair. It cannot continue. You. Let's work together to get an alternative. But in terms of jobs, 27,000 jobs have gone in local government since 2010. We need to invest because it's the knock-on impact to that on local economies. We need to be working with local government to drive local economies, to drive the regional economies of Scotland. And we must invest in skills and apprenticeships and jobs. If we're going to grow the tax take, and we need to grow that tax take in future, then our partners in driving the economy of Scotland is local government. Let's invest in local government. Let's work together. I move the amendment in my name. I now call Murdo Fraser. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think it would be remiss of me to start this debate without uh, congratulating the Finance Secretary on his new look. I'm not sure if it's modelled on Clark Kent or... Geoffrey Howe, circa 1981, uh, but if it's designed to improve his focus on the figures under his command, that's something we should all uh, welcome. Uh, presiding officer, I have some sympathy for the, the points made by Alec Rowley in his 
uh, amendment uh, this afternoon. But I don't think it would be responsible to vote against uh, the local government finance order today after the point where most, if not all, local councils have already set their budgets uh, for next year. But that should not be taken in any way as our endorsement of this government's deal uh, for local authorities, who once again have been treated as the kicking boys in the SNP's budget process. As Alec Rowley pointed out, the report this week from the Accounts Commission puts this all into context. According to the Commission's Deputy Chair, Ronnie Hines, councils are operating in an increasingly demanding environment, with councillors after May facing major challenges from continued reductions in their funding from the Scottish Government and greater demands for services from an ageing population and, in parts of the country, a growing school population. So councils are being asked to do more and more at the same time as their budget is being squeezed. The combination of an ageing population and a greater priority needing to be given to schools increases the cost burden on councils. And this, is, this is all happening at a time when council budgets have been slashed by this government, according to the Accounts Commission, by nearly 10 per cent since 2010-11. Now, it's a continual mantra from the Scottish Government that they have been fair in their settlement to local government, despite Westminster cuts. But the true situation has been laid bare in reports such as this week's from the Accounts Commission and the previous publications by the Fraser of Allender Institute. We know, for example, that the total managed expenditure available to the Scottish Government will be at its highest ever level in the coming financial year in real terms, even before the Barnet consequentials announced in yesterday's budget. In relation to the amount of money available to the Scottish Government for discretionary spend, which is their preferred measure, according to Fraser Vallander, this is roughly the same level as it was when the SNP came to power in 2007, in real terms, before yesterday's Barnet consequentials were added. And if we take as the baseline 2010-11, which of course the SNP preferred to do, because that was the highest historic year previously, Fraser Vallander say that the discretionary element has fallen since that date by just 3.8 per cent in real terms, nowhere near the figure of 9.2 per cent routinely claimed by SNP ministers. And in a contest for truth between the Scottish Government Deputy Presiding Officer and the widely respected and independent Fraser of Allender Institute, I know which I'm going to believe first. So the Scottish Government's discretionary spend is down at worst by 3.8 per cent in real terms. But in the same period, it has cut council budgets by nearly 10 per cent. How can that possibly be a fair settlement? Yes, of course. Kate Forbes. Talking about the settlement with local authorities, we're now at 11 local authorities that haven't chosen to increase council tax to up to 3%. That's the equivalent of £383 million that councils could have that they're choosing not to take for public services. Is that a fair settlement? I think that is a fair settlement if they're not choosing to use this additional income. Well, there, there are some councils, and Bruce Crawford made reference to Stirling Council. I applaud the excellent work done by Conservatives in administration in local government in keeping the council tax bills down. They have had to make some pretty hard choices, they had to drive through efficiencies and th those have been good. But nevertheless, we also got to factor in the fact of this that council tax bills for many people are going up due to no action taken by councils themselves but due to legislation forced through this parliament by the SNP with support of course from the Labour Party and if I remember rightly the Green Party too. So some people are seeing council taxes going up 24 per cent which many people on lower incomes will struggle to pay. And the irony is, at the same time as we're seeing these substantial hikes in council tax, these taxpayers will actually be getting poorer services in return. As the Accounts Commission put it this week, paying more for potentially fewer or reduced services will be a difficult argument to sustain. It's hard to put it any more clearly than that. Deputy Presiding Officer, yesterday the Chancellor announced some £350 million extra for the Scottish Government over the next four years. Our view is that at least some of that cash should go to councils to alleviate their pressures, and this would allow councils, if they chose, to fund local relief schemes for businesses hit, uh, hit by uh, rates revaluation following the lead uh, from south of the border. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, the local government finance settlement that we are seeing today penalises local authorities, and it will mean that local residents will be paying much more in taxes by getting poorer services in return. The only consolation is that eight weeks from today, the council taxpayers of Scotland will have the opportunity to cast their verdict on the performance of this SNP government and the way it treats local government. And I, for one, look forward to hearing their voice. Thank you. 
We now move to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, please. Uh, may I have John Mason to be followed by Ross Thompson. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. I mean, I think we have to accept that in general times are tight. We can none of us do as much as we would like to do. But I do welcome the Audit Scotland report, which showed that the change to council funding since 2010-11 is approximately the same as the reduction in the Scottish Government total budget. That is around 8%. Now, some specific points I would like to make is, firstly, if anyone wants more money for local government, they have to say where it is coming from. And broadly speaking, that means either they cut the money somewhere else or they raise more in taxation. Taking the first one concerning cutting money somewhere else, I do find it fascinating that the opposition parties are not daring to say this. They bleat on about wanting more money for local government, but the obvious answer would be to cut health or universities or some other budget. But do they have the guts to say that? No, they don't. Instead, they try to be all things to all people, saying how much they would support more spending on councils, but they refuse to take the responsible position, which means more money for one sector, meaning less elsewhere. Mr Rowley. Alec Rowley. Mason has been a bit unfair. We've been absolutely clear when we put forward putting the top rate of tax up to 50p. And and, 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 and that would bring between 70 to 120 million pounds. So we've been clear how we would pay for extra funding going into our schools. John Mason. I'll come on to taxation in just a minute, but uh, to carry on with the alternatives for spending, because I actually do find it strange that the all opposition parties all seem to agree that the way the Scottish Government has split up the cake is the correct one. All they're arguing for is a bigger cake, but they never argue that one slice is too big for any sector. Of course, the other option is raising more taxation, as Mr Rowley helpfully said. And this is where I think the Tories are the most hypocritical, because they ask for more spending, but they run scared of taxation. However, other parties, which I understand is Mr Rowley's position, want to raise tax for those on £11,500. And I just do not accept that that can be fair. They also want to take the risk of a 5p jump at the top, 5p differential from the rest of the UK, which I would suggest to him does run the risk of raising even less revenues for people if they leave, they leave Scotland. Now, I do accept it's a balancing act, but I think the government has come to a reasonable position with increases to council tax and now some differentiation from the UK on income tax. My second main point would be the question of allocating resources between councils. Need clearly is the key factor in allocating resources. And of course, not everyone is going to be satisfied. But when you look at the per head allocations, first of all, we have the three island authorities coming top, and that is fairly obvious that they have a lot of extra costs. In fourth place is Argyll and Butte, eh, which has also a huge number of islands, eh, so has the same logic. And then you look at the next three, which are Western Bartonshire, Inverclyde and Glasgow, in fourth, fifth and sixth places per head of eh, finance. And I think that is, is fair in the sense that most people's gut feeling would be that these are the kind of councils that clearly need the most uh, finances for subjects like health, poverty and other challenges. As a Glasgow MSP, I can accept that. Now, I know that some opposition members would take the line that you only fight for your own patch and you forget about the rest of Scotland. But I do not think that is a responsible approach to take. We all have a responsibility both for our local area and for the whole nation. Yes, there are difficult subjects like Edinburgh coping with tourists and Glasgow has the challenge of the Clyde Tunnel. But uh, we do have to make decisions and it's up to national government and local government to negotiate some of these things. My final point would be councils must decentralise. Uh, there have been claims for Labour that the Scottish Parliament needs to decentralise and yet Labour in Glasgow has been one of the most centralist organisations that I know and the SNP is promising a million pounds per ward for local decision making if we win the election in May. Thank you. Thank you. Ross Thompson to be followed by Elaine Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would like to declare an interest as an Aberdeen City Councillor. We hear from SNP ministers in this place that the funding settlement for Scottish councils is fair. But I want to make it abundantly clear to the Scottish Government that nobody in Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire is buying the SNP rhetoric. They're seeing through it. Despite having contributed so much to the wider economy, Aberdeen City is yet again left at the bottom of the local government funding pile. No offence to my uh, colleagues covering Mid-Scotland and Fife, uh, but Clackmannanshire gets more funding per head than Aberdeen. And the people of Aberdeen do not believe that that is fair. Now, to add insult to injury, 
Aberdeen City received one of the biggest cuts of any local authority in Scotland, on top of being the lowest funded, and will not even receive the promised 85% of the national average for the year ahead. Despite all of the empty rhetoric from the Cabinet Secretary about fairness towards local authorities, when you cut through the SNP spin and look at the figures, the Scottish Government have quite simply hammered the north-east of Scotland. In Angus... Mike Rumbles. I understand what the Member is saying. He's quite right to say what he is saying. He's criticising this order. It's absolutely terrible for the North East. Should he not be using his vote, as he's sent here by the people of the North East, to use to vote this order down and ask them to bring another one? Ross Thompson. In, uh, very vocal on behalf of the North East, and I think my colleague Murdo Fraser articulated why at this stage um, the Scottish Conservatives will not be doing that. Um, in Angus, a 2.8% cut. In Aberdeenshire, a 2.9% cut. In Aberdeen City, a 4.6% cut. In fact, Aberdeen is being squeezed almost twice as much as the average council in the country. Now, the Cabinet Secretary... No, I'd like to make some progress. Now, if the Cabinet Secretary is on top of his figures, he will know that Aberdeen City is in the quite unique situation that two-thirds of, it, of its income comes from business rates. Therefore, it was even more unfair that the SNP government attempted to dress up extra funding for all Scottish councils as income that could be used to mitigate against business rate rises. Now, I can assure the Chamber that this fooled no one in the North East business community. Aside from the fact that every council in Scotland received a top-up and only Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire were expected to spend income on rates relief, Mr Mackay and the SNP declined to mention that the overall budgets, no thank you, that the overall budgets for all local authorities were still being cut. A smaller cut is still a cut. And Mr Mackay would be well served to follow the suggestion of my colleague Murdo Fraser that the additional funding from UK government could be used to support local relief schemes. Now the SNP's council tax increases is leaving thousands of local people facing increases in their council tax bills of anywhere between £113 in Band E and about £600 in Band H. Across Aberdeen, over 30,000 properties will be affected and over 45,000 in Aberdeenshire. These figures illustrate the extent to which the SNP's council tax grab disproportionately hits the North East families and households. Many of these same families will also miss out on a UK government income tax cut that the SNP have refused to pass on. This is putting a significant burden on household budgets across the region and an SNP double whammy of paying more but getting absolutely less. Presiding officer, given all of this, the SNP are brave to be travelling to Aberdeen for their party conference next week. Perhaps when on stage, Mr Mackay and all of this central belt biased SNP government will have the humility to finally admit that Aberdeen is the SNP's forgotten city and that the SNP have let down the people of the north east of Scotland. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. Elaine Smith to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Thanks very much, President Officer. It's clear from the recent Accounts Commission report that councils are doing what they can to keep their heads above water and deliver the vital services that our communities rely on. However, this government is not helping them. Councils across Scotland have seen their funds slashed by hundreds of millions by this government in the last year alone. And the responsibility for the cuts to our councils, the inequality, the unemployment and the loss of service that comes as a result of these cuts is the clear responsibility of this SNP government and they cannot keep passing the buck back to councils. Overall, since 2011, the SNP have cut council revenue budgets by £1.5 billion. At what point is the government going to stop cutting and start investing in our communities. Councils have shaved their services down to the bone and there are no more efficiencies to be found. In the last five years alone, 15,000 people have been made redundant due to Scottish Government cuts. And that's not just a number. That's people's lives, it's their families' futures and it's their local services that they have lost. Now, frequently we hear of task forces to help workers when private companies pull out of communities with the loss of several hundred jobs the Scottish Government send in pace. And then there's the Scottish Energy Task Force to deal with employment and skill losses in the energy sector. And there was a Scottish Steel, for, uh, Steel Task Force set up to try and protect jobs at Dell and Clyde Bridgeworks. These are welcome, but there's not been a task force, has there, to deal with the thousands of job losses that have occurred across local government. And sometimes local government is the biggest employer in our communities. President Officer, in response to John Mason, it's clear 
but the government is that want to drain councils of power and funds into centralised functions. But actually, it's councils that are best placed to identify the problems in their communities and in partnership with stakeholders and indeed the trade unions to get the solutions to those issues. However, cuts on top of cuts means that they're forced to reduce services to increase charges and that impacts disproportionately on the most vulnerable. The number of over 75s in eight councils across Scotland is set to double by 2039. That means council services are going to cost more than they ever have before. And this government is also letting young people down, passing cuts on to the next generation. The number of Scottish children living in temporary accommodation increased by 17% last year. Children are missing out on books and places to study, with libraries closing and staff down by a third since 2010. And support staff are being cut from our schools, leaving thousands of children with additional needs without the help that they need. And these are all the direct result of short-sighted Scottish government cuts. Council services are vital. They support the most vulnerable in society. They save lives and their services benefit all of us and they need to be properly funded. John McAlpine. John McAlpine. Briefly, please. I, thank, I thank the member for taking her intervention. She's halfway through her speech and she hasn't said anything yet about the Tory government in London who are cutting Scotland's budget by £2.9 billion. Elaine Smith. Well, interestingly, presiding officer, and I thank the member for her intervention, because if she cares to listen, I'm just about to get to them. Sadly, between the Tories at Westminster and the SNP at Holyrood, there isn't much chance of councils being properly funded over the next few years. Scottish Labour, however, take the challenges our society faces seriously, and we believe that the richest should pay a bit more to stop these destructive cuts to our essential local services. That is a sensible and progressive approach to stopping austerity. The regressive council tax should be replaced, as the SNP promised it would be years ago, not tweaked as they are doing now. A local government finance package that decreases employment, depletes services and defunds the young is unacceptable. President officer, we now have one of the most powerful devolved legislations in the world, two decades after this parliament was established and ten years since the SNP came to power, we should use those powers to end austerity, support our children and communities and deliver a fairer, more equal society for all. Thank you. Call on Andy Whiteman to be followed by Mike Brumbles. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this is an important debate. It's this debate and our decision on the Local Government Finance Order this evening that provides the funding for a very wide range of vital public services, from educating Scotland's young people to environmental health, social care, leisure and recreation, transport, housing and the very system of local democracy uh, itself. Scottish Green politics is founded upon fundamental principles, one of which is uh, radical democracy. And we are a party that is committed to deepening and strengthening local democracy. The finance settlement uh, today is a substantial improvement uh, on the draft local government settlement, £160 million better in fact, and communities across Scotland will welcome this additional resource that has already mitigated many of the planned cuts uh, in local services. And the settlement we are voting on today represents a change from a 1.6% cut in real terms in the draft budget in December to a 0.1% cut in real terms for this final, final settlement as evidenced by the SPICE analysis of 6 February 2017. And importantly, if we add the change to the council tax multiplier, which provides an additional £111 million of funding to local government, we're now looking at a 0.7 real terms increase in funding for local government budget 2016 to budget 2017. Now, I accept, as others have uh, mentioned, that local government is still facing massive challenges, many of these identified by the Accounts Commission uh, earlier this week. And I also accept that other parties interpret the numbers in a variety of ways and indeed that's part of the problem with this whole budget process and indeed this lack of scrutiny this lack of transparency rather was an issue identified by the local government and communities committee in its report on the draft budget but not only is it important to have more transparent reporting we believe that we also need a completely new approach to local government finance we've already debated the question of local tax and got nowhere the regressive council tax remains but i do sincerely hope now that this budget is agreed that we can have the further discussions that Alex Rowley was talking about on reform during this parliament. But in our view, more fundamental reform is still needed. I do not feel comfortable sitting in this parliament and voting on how much money local government should receive. 
Together with council tax freezes and now rate capping, the growing centralisation of local government finance has undermined local democracy for too long. Only 12% of the funding of Scotland's local authorities is under their own fiscal control. And even the meagre autonomy, this meagre autonomy is compromised by the Tory-style rate capping imposed not by statute, but by the Scottish Government holding councils to ransom by punishing them if they set council tax rate that do not meet the preferences of the Scottish Government. The Minister in his opening remarks talked about a 3% council tax rise being, and I quote, allowed. He knows he has no statutory authority to impose that, and that's precisely why that is not in this order today. And this situation is why tomorrow we will be publishing a paper proposing a fiscal framework for local government. Just as a set of rules now exist to govern the financial relationship between the UK and Scotland, which provides a degree of clarity, certainty, transparency and predictability to the financial arrangements between both, so too should there be a similar framework in place governing the process by which local government finance is agreed. This finance order published today forms part of the budget deal agreed between ourselves and the Scottish Green Party and the Scottish Government. And notwithstanding our real concerns about how the financial settlement is reached, and in particular the constraints placed on Council's fiscal autonomy, we'll be voting for the motion uh, this evening. This vote is about providing the resources that deliver vital services to people right across Scotland. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Uh, Mike Rumbles, to be followed by Ruth Maguire. Presiding Officer, 17 years ago, I voted against the very first local government finance order presented to the Scottish Parliament. This order was of course presented by the coalition government of the day which I supported. I did not support that order however because per head of population Aberdeenshire Council was clearly underfunded and at the bottom of the queue. I happened to be a Liberal Democrat but I was first and foremost elected to represent my constituents. And I say to the Conservatives in particular, and particularly the Conservatives from the North East, that means I was prepared to use my vote against the government when I needed to. This vote against the government resulted in ministers accepting the need for change and in future finance orders, improved funding for the North East. They brought them back. I have to say that things have changed since those early days of the Parliament and not to the good. How many times have backbench SNP members voted against their government when their constituents, constituents have been badly affected or harshly affected by the actions of that government. It'll never happen. Well, there you are. That's my point, isn't it? How pathetic that is. There are occasions when it is really important to put part... It's worth listening, I think. There are occasions when it is important to put party interests to one side and use your vote in the interests of the people that you represent. This is one of those occasions. The order is, I, I've only got four minutes and I will if I have time. This order before us is a fraud. It purports to show that the government has kept its word and that no council would receive less than 85% of the average council funding. Independent research from the Scottish Parliament's own information service shows that using the government's own figures, Aberdeen City Council is being shortchanged by some £3.6 million by this order. The Scottish Government has fiddled the figures by taking the average not of the 32 Scottish councils, but only of 28. And the Finance Minister knows this. It has taken the top four councils, I will if I have time, but I'm halfway through. Presiding officer nodding? Yep. Happy, happy to. Democrat. It's not the case that Aberdeen hasn't had its fair share, but can I make a wider question to Mike Rumbles? This isn't about party politics. For us to change the formula would mean changing the partnership arrangements with local government through COSLA. Is Mike Rumbles suggesting that I don't engage in that ongoing partnership arrangement with COSLA to arrive at a different decision on how we distribute local government finance? Mike Rumbles. So over the last 17, 18 years, repeatedly from different finance ministers, and John Swinney was the master at this, it's entirely up to the finance minister to decide which funding formulas that particularly seem to work. Um, now, I could have said the Scottish Government is even, that's even worse with its own figures. I could have said that they previously promised no council would receive less than 85% of average funding support from the Scottish Government. But what the Scottish Government has done is to change their promise. They now promise that no council will have less than 85% of the spending power of the average council. That's their own revenues plus government support. 
As I have shown, however, the Scottish Government, even by changing their promise, can't achieve the 85% average without actually fiddling the figures. Now, there is no doubt that the people of Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire are being shortchanged by the Scottish Government. And Ross Thompson is hand, holding his head in his hands there, and I can see why. Not only have nearly half the homes across... Well, that's rather rude, but there we are. Not only have nearly half the homes across the North East on a very serious issue, and he said it himself. It can't be that bad, can it, Ross? If, it, if, if, if these are your words... The North East seen their council tax rise by up to 25% for no increase in council services. The two councils are once again at the end of the queue. Any North East MSP can see that our region is being shortchanged. I can't understand why the five North East Conservative MSPs are not going to vote against this order. I can't understand where the other three are. They're not even here in the debate. I'm the only Liberal Democrat from the North East. Please, Chair, please. There are five Conservative MSPs from the North East, and where are they? Any North MSP worth their salt would see that it's now to put, time, put party loyalties to a side. That's what we should be doing. That's what we did and have done, and you should be doing it. Conservatives and SNP. As I said 17 years ago, I voted against my own government's finance order because it was wrong. This order is wrong. In conclusion, we need all North East MSPs to stand up for the people we represent and vote this order down. That was a bad call, particularly from the Conservative finance spokesman. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm happy to speak in support of the Local Government Finance Scotland Order 2017. I'm in no doubt the crucial role played by local government when it comes to the health, well-being and prosperity of every single community and constituency in Scotland and believe this settlement ensures a strong and fair deal for local authorities. In the face of drastic Tory cuts to our own budget from Westminster, the Scottish Government has treated local government very fairly. This is not just the opinion on these benches, but one shared by the Accounts Commission. As we have heard, a report from the Commission last year showed that the reduction in real-term funding of councils since 2010-11 is the same as the reduction in the Scottish Government's total budget over the same period. To quote it directly, taking into <coughs> account 2016-17 funding, councils have experienced a real-term reduction in funding of 8.4% since 2010-11. This is approximately the same as the reduction to the Scottish Government's total budget over the same period. Not at the moment. Furthermore, even the reductions that have been seen here are nothing like the cuts faced by local authorities in England, which amount to a 40% real-term reduction, according to the Local Government Association, and leave local authorities in England in a serious funding crisis, with many crucial services suffering. Now, we're often criticised from the opposition benches for comparing the work of this Scottish Government with that of its Tory counterpart in London. However, whilst we in Scotland remain at the mercy of the cuts and policies of a Tory Westminster government that we didn't vote for, I make no apology for drawing attention to the stark contrasts and to the hypocrisy of certain benches in this chamber or for commending the Scottish government for the mitigation job it so often finds itself forced into doing in response to decisions made in London. In contrast to the gung-ho approach of the Tories in Westminster, the Scottish Government must also be commended for its commitment to listening and to compromise in the course of the budget negotiations. As a result, additional attainment funding will come from the national budget and not from local taxation. Not only this, but local authorities will receive £120 million, £20 million more than previously committed to support schools across the country in closing the attainment gap. In addition, an extra £160 million of funding has been pledged to local government as a result of compromise and negotiation. This extra money, together with other sources of support available through the actual and potential increases in council tax income and the support through the health and social care integration, amounts to an overall increase of over £400 million. As such, as we've heard, the real terms increase in available support for local government in 2017-18 is now considerably more favourable when compared with the real terms increase in the overall Scottish budget. The contrast with the fate of councils in England at the mercy of a right-wing, austerity-driven Tory government could not be clearer. Presiding officer, it's clear that this is a strong, fair and balanced settlement for local government, reached through compromise and negotiation. 
and ensuring that our local authorities are supported to deliver the crucial services that we all rely on. And if I may just finish with a quote from one of the councillors in North Ayrshire. Delivering better outcomes in partnership with our communities, reducing poverty and building a better future for our young people is at the very heart of what we're trying to do in North Ayrshire. We've managed to deliver a budget which not only achieves that balance, but also helps those most in need while protecting frontline services and jobs. Indeed, there will be additional jobs as a result of our budget. That isn't a quote from one of my SNP colleagues. That's from the Labour leader, Joe Cullinan. Sounds like a fair settlement to me. Thank you. Brian Whittle to be followed by Willie Coffey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, when discussing local government finance, we need to keep in mind that we're considering more than just entries on Derek Mackay's ledger. There are real people affected at the end of every decision that he and his government make. And East Ayrshire Council are having to deal with a 3.5% cut in their funding, equating to £1.6 million. And although they are forced to make it a 3% hike in council tax, this does not even come close to filling the gap. So they have no option but to pass the cuts down the line. And one of the most important activities councils undertake, and one that is least talked about, is their support for charities, community groups and other th third sector organisations in their area. Whenever we talk about frontline services supported by councils, we would do well to include these third sector organisations in that group. Now, my concern is that given the third sector is very often the most cost effective way to deliver essential support services directly into local communities, and with an ability to target communities' needs in a way impossible for central government, what will be the fallout when these services are cut from those receiving that lifeline? What happens to the service users of Ad Action in Kilmarnock, which is a drop-in centre for recovering addicts, or Morven Day Services, which is a mental health drop-in centre, or the players at Power Chair Football, or the Ace Race Running Club, or WG13, giving our young people another chance for learning? All reliant on life-changing services delivered by the third sector and volunteers. Well, let me tell you what will happen. Increased physical and mental is issues will result in medical interventions, a and &E admissions. Some will end up in the ju judicial system or welfare system. Not my words, presiding officer. Words directly from the service users themselves. Mr. John uh, Mason. I will. John Mason. I, th I thank the member for giving way. Given the problems that East Ayrshire seems to be facing, does he agree with his colleague that Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire should get a larger percentage of the money? Hey, well, I, tell you, I, I, I know that uh, the Scottish Government are always keen to have a constructive debate in this chamber, and admittedly, the SNP dictionary def definition of constructive debate reads as forming agreement regardless of logical flaws and spineless acceptance of assertions regardless of factual accuracy, or comment on to dogma-driven strategy regardless of expected outcomes. See also Scottish Greens. What I will say, what I will say to the member is there was a third option. There was a third option in your speech, and that would have been less waste from the Scottish Government. For example, yeah. with the cap payment in I6 and NHS 24, you had an overspend of £250 million, yeah. which could have been in, and then this resolution. <coughs> Shush. <laughs> Increased physical and mental issues result in medical interventions, A&E admissions. Some will end up in the judicial system or welfare system. These are not my words. They are words directly from the service users themselves. Mr Mackay may force them to wipe, wipe them off the council ledger, but they will reappear on another page in the public ledger. However, the real cost is far more personal. I have had enough. And it is not just third sector organisations where cuts to local authority budgets will lead to greater pressures on other budgets. Last week, the BBC revealed the outcome of research I undertook into where food from their schools comes from. This revealed a number of examples where the food was being imported when it could be grown locally. I have no doubt that the decisions which led local authorities to buy chicken from Thailand and frozen mashed potatoes from France were driven in no small part by budget limitations. In much the same way, Aberdeen City Council warned last week that if budgets are not increased, they may have to cut the amount of fruit and vegetables in their school meals. Presenting officers, that is a Scottish local authority openly stating that it may be left open with no option but to offer school pupils meals with fewer fruit and vegetables. De De Presiding officer, Derek Mackay needs to know and should know that rather than addressing the very issues he and his government allegedly hold most important, that is gr the growing health inequality gap, the growing attainment gap, care of the elderly and infirm, in other words, the most vulnerable in our society, it's those self-same people who will ultimately suffer the most. Numbers and statistics are people, Mr Mackay. Where is the social justice you keep talking about? The SNP government may talk about the importance of social justice, but with their actions, they show us how little they understand it. Thank you. 
Thank you. Willie Coffey, and then we'll move to closing speeches. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, President, President Officer. Just uh, to remind Mr Huttle and the rest of his colleagues and everybody else that the Tories in East Ayrshire actually voted for the budget in its entirety. So if it was that bad, why did you vote for it? Um, President Officer, today's order gives effect to the budget approved by Parliament and puts vital cash into the hands of Scotland's councils. Roughly £10 billion is allocated to the councils and an extra £383 million will support local services as a result of the additional allocations made on top of other supports added to the baseline allocations. Now, for my own authority, and here are the real figures in East Ayrshire, it means that our initial baseline allocation of £233 million, which itself is an increase on the previous year's baseline, will be further enhanced by another £10.5 million. When you take into account further additional support provided, meaning this year East Ayrshire Council will have around £242 million, an increase of 4.9% to deliver all of our local services. This support allows our councils to fund education, health, social care, cultural leisure, roads and recycling and a host of other services. In addition, it will see over £2 million coming directly to schools in my constituency to help our young folk to raise their attainment to at least get on a par with their counterparts elsewhere in Scotland. Helping to close the poverty-related attainment gap is surely something we would all want to support. It's a £750 million investment over the term of this Parliament. So, why on earth would anybody want to oppose that? Well, sadly, Tory and Lamer MSPs did oppose that. They voted against this vital cash coming to local schools in Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley and everyone else, everywhere else in Scotland. But I bet, presiding officer, they'll be first in line to get their photos taken at these schools when we celebrate the achievements of these young people. And in fact, St Joseph's Academy from Kilmarnock were in the Parliament just earlier on, and I didn't hear Mr Whittle explaining to them why he voted against that school getting £86,000 extra oh. as a result of this attainment oh. fund. Kept quiet about that. Sure. Brian oh. Whittle. As the member well knows, uh, when, when schools that visit, I don't get involved in politics. As, as it, uh, <laughs> un, un, unlike, unlike one of your colleagues who went completely political uh, and over the top, that's why I didn't mention any of that. Thank you. Willie Coffey. It's now on the record and the pupils at St Joseph's now know that the Tories voted against that £86,000 going to St Joseph's Academy. As part of the overall settlement, we will see substantial support of £250 million to take forward the integration of health and social care and a further £107 million to deliver the living wage for social care workers. This means that those in receipt of war pensions, for example, won't be penalised when they are assessed for social care. And as I mentioned, the Attainment Fund is a significant investment and has already seen the appointment of 160 full-time teachers. What we should try to remember is that the last time Labour was in power, the council tax shot up by over 60 per cent in my authority, and it was the SNP who froze it for nine years in a row. Undue rises like that will not be permitted again, but the councils can, if they choose to, raise an extra £70 million every year by deploying the 3% uplift. I've no time, I've got a bit to finish here. That 3% uplift was supported by the Tories in East Ayrshire. One of the interesting developments we, that has been seen has been to see which authorities have decided to continue with the council tax freeze. Despite all the shouting and screaming we've heard in this chamber over the past few years that the council tax freeze must end, coincidental perhaps, but they all appear to be Labour-led councils and all heading for an election in a matter of weeks. Presiding officer, the local government settlement is a fair settlement and brings additional financial resources to support a wide range of local services. According to Audit Scotland, it broadly follows the same part of, an allocate, of allocation from the UK government, which, I will remind members, saw a huge cut of nearly £3 billion to Scotland over the past 10 years to, to, to 2020. And that was supported by Scottish Labour MPs at Westminster at the time, which goes some way to explaining why 40 of them lost their seats. Schools, pupils, teachers and social care workers and thousands of council staff across Scotland need this settlement today to be agreed by the Parliament so that they can all get on with the good work they collectively do on Scotland's behalf. And I hope the Parliament backs the order at 5pm today. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to closing speeches. Uh, James Kelly to close for the Labour Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to 
oppose the order in the name of Mr Mackay and support the amendment in the name of my colleague uh, Alec Rowley. I think it has been a I think it has been, a, Mr Mackay, a very uh, interesting and important debate um, because it's brought out some of the, the issues in terms of people's attitude to local government. We've heard a series of speeches for, from these uh, SNP benches telling us how it's a fair settlement. Um, that's obviously the, the line that's come out from SNP command. But the reality is that there's £170 million been cut from council budgets. In Glasgow alone, I'd remind Mr Mason, there's a £53 million shortfall. And these are not just figures on a spreadsheet. What this will mean is that jobs will be lost, uh, libraries will be closed, uh, care packages will be compromised. And people on the ground uh, will have to deal with the impact of these cuts. Alec Rowley, uh, drawing on his experience as a council leader and speaking to, to one of his colleagues, gave the example of why would somebody, you know, the, uh, the difficulties local councillors face year on year um, having to deal with these budgetary challenges? And this is brought out in the, the Accounts Commission report, you know, because we see from that that there's been a billion, over a billion pounds of cuts since 2011. And the Fraser of Allender Institute forecasts that another billion pounds of cuts are coming down the line to 2021. So local government uh, are facing the brunt of these. And, you know, as Elaine Smith pointed out, it's the accumulation of these decisions that have been made by the SNP in control of the Scottish Parliament uh, where uh, local councils uh, have been penalised. And there was, there, was, there was another option, there was another way of doing it. Um, in contrast to the Tories, uh, Labour actually proposed you know, tax changes, which would have produced extra funding if, for example, as Alec Rowley, just let me make some progress, uh, as Alec Rowley pointed out, uh, by taxing top rate taxpayers, we'd have raised in the, in the region of £100 million, and that would have made a difference to local councils on the ground. And I think there's also an important point about uh, the impact that that, have, that, that has on uh, not just local services, but also the local economy. Yes, I'll give way, Mr. Stewart. Kevin Stewart. Um, Mr. Kelly mentioned tax rises, and he said uh, 100 million. Mr. Rowley said between 70 and 100 million. Uh, and his leader at one point said it may only raise zero. It may re not raise anything at all. Now, the thing that they've been disingenuous about today, and maybe Mr Kelly can answer this for me, presiding officer, does he think it's fair that those earning £11,500 a year should pay for extra taxation to pay for Tory austerity? James Kelly. That's not true. Those earning £11,500 wouldn't pay any extra. Do you know, do you know what that, you know, this comes to the nub of this debate? The nub of this debate, in my 10 years as an MSP, I've watched SNP minister after SNP minister stand up at various question times and say, oh, we could do more about the health service, we could do more about local government, we could do more about education, if only we had more powers. And Derek Mackay is the finance secretary who's had more power than any finance secretary in the history of devolution because he had tax raising powers, he had the opportunity to, to make that difference, to alleviate the cuts that councils are going to have to make, but he didn't do it. And see, and see as we move to these council elections that Mr Mason mentioned, the SNP MSPs and those back benches and front benches are going to have to account to the electorate and are going to have to apologise for the cuts that they are passing down the line that are going to mean jobs lost and services closed. And that's why we will be opposing this order at five o'clock tonight. Thank you. Graeme Simpson to wind up for the Conservative Party. How long, presiding officer? <laughs> Five minutes, but actually Up we've got two. time in hand because you've all been very well, we'll disciplined. We'll see how we get on. Um, <laughs> um, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll first declare an interest uh, as a serving councillor in South Lanarkshire. Um, 
Murdo uh, Fraser kick, kicked off for us um, by mentioning the uh, Accounts Commission report um, and uh, also drew reference to uh, Derek Mackay's uh, new look, um, comparing him to uh, Clark, Clark Kent. Um, uh, from, from my eyes, it's more like uh, it's more proclaimers than Superman. Um, uh, Brian. Uh, Brian Whittle um, mentioned cuts in uh, East Ayrshire um, and also cuts to uh, school, school meals. Um, Ross Thompson and Mike Rumbles got into a bit of a personal discussion uh, about uh, Ab Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. Well, uh, that's their right. They both represent that area. They both feel it's been hard done to. Um, Elaine, Elaine Smith... Um, Elaine Smith... Uh, uh, talked about the demographic uh, pressures, uh, rightly so, and Andy Whiteman touched on uh, a lack of transparency, which, uh, as were both members of the local government committee, uh, he rightly says uh, our committee uh, picked up on uh, and, and mentioned in its official report. The background to all this uh, is a local government settlement that, despite the smoke and mirrors uh, used by the finance secretary, sees another year-on-year -year cut. It's been laid bare by the Accounts Commission report this week. £260 million real terms cut in revenue grant in one year. 15,000 full-time equivalent jobs lost in local government under the SNP since 2011. Does the member take intervention? Sure. Mike Rumbles. I was wondering why anyone should listen to what the Conservative Party are saying on this when the so-called strong opposition refuses to vote or use their vote to vote this down. A strong opposition? Graeme Simpson. We've had the debate about the budget. No. The, budget's gone, the budget's gone through. If we're, to vote, if we're to vote this down, local government won't get any money. Now, our position, our position is very clear. Our position is very clear. We're not happy with the amount that local government is getting, but if we devote that down, local government won't get the money. That's the logic of that position. Now, if, that's, if the settlement is as rosy as Derek Mackay would have us believe, then not a single council in Scotland would be making any cuts. That's the logic of his position. But in fact, the reverse is true. They're all making cuts. Maybe they can't add up, or maybe it's Mr Mackay whose sums are out. I'll go for the latter. No thanks. Um, cuts, of course, lead to poorer services. The Accounts Commission noted that our streets are getting dirtier. That's one effect of making local government a Cinderella service. And as you'd expect, though, some councils cope rather better with the challenges than others. I'm sure we'd all wish, no, we'd, we'd all wish to congratulate Conservative-run South Ayrshire Council for what the Accounts Commission says has been considerable progress in delivering improvements and meeting financial challenges as a result of effective political and managerial leadership. That's a direct quote, Mr Mackay. Your councils could learn from that. And this week on South Ayrshire. <laughs> Derek Mackay. I'm curious of the Conservatives' front bench position because we're picking off individual councils and I can pick off the figures of each individual council to talk about the increase in spending power. But I'm very curious of the official position of the Conservatives. Uh, does Graham Simpson believe that money should be taken away from the central belt and given to Aberdeen in the fashion that Ross Thompson suggested? Graham Simpson. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm not here to pick off uh, individual councils, Mr Mackay. I'm here to talk about the overall settlement, which is a, uh, a rum deal for local government overall. Uh, but this week we've had a UK budget which sees an extra £350 million coming to Scotland. Um, so perhaps the Cabinet, so perhaps you could tell me, uh, will any of that money be coming to local government, as Murdo Mackay has uh, suggested. Well, we didn't, we didn't really... Sorry. Yeah, can't do that again. <laughs> Keep getting you mixed up. But what is the answer? Will any of that money come to local government? You have the opportunity to say yes. 
Yes. Uh, I appreciate that maybe Graham Simpson is now looking for our assistance to help find, fill the extra time. Uh, can I then ask the Conservatives at what point you have had this conversion for extra support to local government, considering it was in the public domain that the Conservatives asked were all about essentially tax cuts for the richest in society. At what point has there been this conversion that really what you really wanted from the budget was more money for local government because it wasn't an ask in any of the discussions with me? Graeme Simpson, if you could conclude your remarks, Mr Simpson. I will conclude my remarks because he didn't answer the point which I gave him the opportunity to do. Um, so uh, we can assume that no extra money will, will be coming. Um, we will not be uh, voting uh, ag against it. Um, that would be ir irresponsible. Um, local government does need the extra money, uh, does need to have a settlement. Um, so, but we will back the amendment because we agree with every single word of the amendment. Yeah. Thank you. Kevin Stewart to wind up the debate. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the importance of today's debate cannot be underestimated. The 2017 Local Government Finance Order before us today is seeking parliamentary approval to the guaranteed payment of almost £9.3 billion in revenue support to be paid to Scotland's 32 local authorities to enable them to provide the people of Scotland with the services they need and deserve. Uh, we can argue as long as we want about the interpretation of the numbers, but the fact is, as can be seen in the table provided for members at the back of the chamber, that there will be an extra £383 million available to support local services in 2017-18, which is an increase of 3.7 per cent compared to this year. I'll give way to Mr Rowley. Alec Rowley. I'm grateful for Mr Stewart taking the intervention. Can I ask, COSLA has asked the government, in terms of the, the consequentials of the budget statement yesterday, I think 350 million, of which 190 is revenue. COSLA is asking that that money go to health and social care and education. As local government minister, will you be putting pressure on the Cabinet Secretary for Finance to get some of that money into health and social care and education? Kevin Stewart. Well, can I say that we've taken action in social care and education? Um, we have created integrated joint boards uh, to pool budgets together to provide the best possible services for people. Uh, and we also, of course, have the £120 million attainment fund, uh, which many of the opposition parties in this parliament uh, have voted down or tried to vote down. What I would say um, to Mr Rowley is that there will be a huge list of folk asking <laughs> Mr Mackay what he's going to do with these consequentials. Um, and, uh, the consequentials th themselves sound like manna from heaven, but they are not going to make up from the, for, for the £2.9 billion cut that Westminster has imposed in this place. And I wish there had been more talk of that today than some of the spurious things that have been talked about, because the reality quite simply is that these cuts passed down from Westminster are having a major effect on people's lives here in Scotland. Today's local government finance order seeks agreement to the main I'll give way to you in a second seeks agreement to the main allocation of revenue funding to local government for 2017-18 uh, and updates funding allocations for 2016-17 total funding for 2017-18 uh, amounts to over 10.4 billion pounds this includes revenue funding of 9.6 billion pounds of which we are distributing over £9.3 billion in this order. The overall 2017-18 settlement funding package will provide a, an additional £107 million to support integration of health and social care services. It will assist local authorities uh, in raising attainment and closing the attainment gap by providing uh, attainment for Scotland funding of £170 million. It will maintain the pupil-teacher ratio and it removes the council tax freeze uh, and implements council tax reforms. Uh, the Scottish Government has treated local government very fairly despite the cuts to the Scottish budget uh, from the UK government. I will give way to Mr Fraser. Uh, Fraser. Just on that point, I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way 
Why, if according to Fraser of Allender, the Scottish Government's discretionary spend is down 3.8% in real terms since 2010-11, as the Scottish Government cut the funding to local government in the same period by nearly 10%? How can that possibly be fair? Kevin I think that uh, I would dispute some of the figures that Mr Fraser has given, including... Uh, in, in, uh, we have got a situation of £2.9 billion worth of cuts passed on from your government. Now, if you were actually doing your job properly, you would be lobbying the Chancellor the chair, please, for Minister. much more Through than the, the chair, wee please. bit of consequentials that we're getting uh, out of this budget, because it does not compensate for the cuts that have been made to this place. Start standing up for your constituents here in Scotland. The local government finance settlement, including the extra £160 million announced on the 2nd of Seb February, plus the other sources of support available through the actual and potential increases in council tax income, and the support through health and social care integration, would have amounted to a potential overall increase of over £400 million, or 3.9% in cash terms, or £249.7 million, or 2.4% in real terms. Local authorities have uh, now finalised their own budgets, uh, with the exception of Clack Manager, who set their council tax but not their budget, uh, which should include uh, provision for each of the elements included uh, in the package. Uh, as a result of uh, this, 11 councils have chosen not to increase their council tax levels by the maximum allowable 3%. Uh, this has reduced the overall support for services to £383 million, or 3.7% in cash terms. Uh, the figures for 2017-18 um, presented for approval today uh, include two significant additions uh, from the provisional distributed figures issued on 15th of December. Uh, £130 million of revenue, uh, which is a which the Cabinet Secretary announced as stage one of the budget bill, and an extra £10 million in respect of the discretionary housing payments, increasing the total support available next year to £52.9 million to mitigate some of the worst excesses of Tory welfare reform. In addition to the 2017-18 allocations, today's order also seeks approval uh, to an extra, for an extra £51.7 million pounds for 2016-17. These represent sums either undistri undistributed at the time of the 2016 order or funding that has become available during the year. Uh, and these include £37.5 million to fund the teachers' induction scheme, £5 million to support the 1 plus 2 languages policy, £2.4 million pounds to support the council tax reform changes, and £1.7 million pounds to provide additional financial support um, to flooded communities. Minister, if you can conclude. Uh, I, I, I'm in my conclusion. last wee bit, please. Thanks, President Officer. Uh, in summing up, um, I must take uh, this opportunity uh, to respond to Mr Rumble's accusations uh, that the Scottish Government is shortchanging Aberdeen City Council through the application of the 85% funding floor. Mr uh, Rumble's uh, talked about voting against the order when he first came to this Parliament against his own government. And that shows the impotence uh, of Mr Rumble's when it came to these issues. And what I would say is this, that the only reason that we have the 85% funding floor anyway is because of the work of the late Brian Adam uh, and other North East SNP MSPs who lobbied hard to ensure that that floor Absolutely. was put in place. So thanks to Brian Adam uh, for his efforts in this regard and no thanks to, uh, to Mr Rumbles who was impotent when it came to these issues. Thank you, Minister. Um, I find Minister. it extraordinary um, that he can criticise the Scottish Government remarks, over please. the 85% floor. Uh, since the Scottish Government first Minister, introduced the 85% funding remarks. floor, three minutes over time. Please conclude your remarks. Um, Aberdeen has benefited for, from over 42 
£1.2 million because of that. Presiding officer, I encourage the Parliament to support the local government finance order before us uh, in Parliament today to ensure our local authorities can get on with the delivery of our vital local services without the worry of knowing when and how their funding will be provided by the Scottish Government. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on the local government finance order. We'll now move on to the next item of business. We'll just take a moment for ministers and others to change seats. I'll move straight on as time is tight in this debate. The next item of business is a debate on motion 4493 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham and Scotland's biodiversity. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Rosanna Cunningham to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The natural environment is worth more than £20 billion per annum to our economy and supports uh, more than six.